I've decided this evening to just talk about all of the problems that naturally arise if we can talk about something within us that can separate from the body. And if it can separate from the body, that means there's some kind of a trip or a journey. And everything we say is really a consequence of this, this one simple statement. It can only journey if it is. If it is, it must have some definable limit. If it can, it must go from one place to another. To journey implicit in us must be that it can then move from some place, a body, to something that is not a body. So all of the particular and curious questions emerge once you question, once you explore this issue of the journey. I think it comes down to four basic problems. Here we are. Now, I'll take it first in terms of the journey. If it can separate, if it can separate from a body, if it can separate from a body, then that is, must be some kind of a collective. It must retain some kind of, for lack of a better word, uh, form. Shh, right? form not in the sense of a shape, but some kind of identity. If it can retain an identity, then there must be something then that sets its boundaries. And what's interesting about this is that we just don't want it to retain an identity. We want it to retain a particular identity, which we call the self. Now, if therefore there is one authentic account of a soul separating from the body, that means then if it separates there must be some kind of a vehicle. By that I mean something just, of, nothing other than what we just described, I'm putting it together in one word and saying it's a vehicle. So if I draw here a picture of a man, let us say for the moment therefore I can talk about the soul and represent it in this way with wings. Right. And since it has the capacity for, we hope, experience, then we can say there must be an eye of the soul and therefore I put a little face in there. But right now I'll just put one eye in there. Of course that means it's a cyclops but it isn't intended that way. All right, now if we say then it can separate from the body, then by necessity it's a bodiless thing, right? It's not, a, it can't be a body. It separates from the body. Unless we have an operation and we remove a limb from a limb. But this seems to be the question of whether or not if it separates, if it retains an identity in its separation, and if it does maintain an identity, then we have a curious kind of question. Not only how did it do it, Not only why did it do it, but what we can say if it does it. Now, if it can separate, obviously there must be a return. So 
So therefore, if separation a return, because otherwise there'd be some question about whether or not there ever was a separation. Therefore, this is talking about the separation of the soul from the body while someone is still living. If that is at all possible, then we have this interesting process of a separation, what? separation, and a return. If we have the separation and the return, then we can ask whether or not that return from that soul trip is in any way similar to how the body got it in the first place. Because if it can separate from the body, then how did it get it in the first place? So that's an interesting question. Right? How, did it, how did the body become ensouled? And then once in soul, how does it function? How does it function? How does it function in the body? And why, why would it even function in the body? I mean, why did it even get involved in the body? Well. So we have one, how did it get there? Two, what is it doing while it's there? Three, if there's a separation, we are quite interested in that separation. And four, we're interested in the return. Now, Everything we say is to try to make sense of some person's account of a separation and a return. Everything we say really follows this, and these are all the problems. Now, would you not agree, if there is a return, then we can ask, was it worth it? What, in what way is it a positive or a negative experience? We can say, look here, it's very nice to have separated, but maybe the separation caused irreparable harm to the psyche in some way, and therefore it shouldn't be done. In the same way, we can say, what advantage accrued to the individual? Or, was it a fall? Was the fact that the soul enters the body, was that a result of a fall, a negative, or was it a positive? Once and sold, how does it function? Is there something it does equally well that we can put in plus and minuses? So when and sold, how does it function? Because if it's important for us to have a body, why separate from it? Now the separation, the very process of the separation. We can equally ask, is, as we did a moment ago, is there a plus and minus to each of these? Each of these questions, therefore, require an answer. Looking for answers based upon just that one step whether or not the soul can, is capable of making a journey independent of the body while still alive brings all of these issues up. The way you try to answer them from the experience and filling them out into a rational whole, if that is to say if you can find some way of making, I hesitate before calling making sense of it, but making it into a rational whole, because if you can bring together all of these parts that fit together rationally, then you're giving an account of the soul. And that's the whole study of the soul. Eschatology, right? That's a whole study of the soul. 
So when you make the rational, you are then involved in philosophy. But that's only true under one, one assumption. And that assumption is that in that separation, in that separation, there has to be something like wisdom that's encountered, and it has to have such a positive value that in that separation, that the possibility then of seeing apart from the body justifies the separation and the journey, and therefore it must awaken some kind of intense desire for it, the object of its goal, and if it in fact includes some idea of beauty, then we can say clearly, since all men desire what is beautiful, there necessarily must be a love for beauty. And again, as we said before, if we can say the most beautiful thing is akin to wisdom, then we can say it naturally follows that a rational explanation of the separation of the soul from the body is philosophy if in that separation the soul encounters a marvelous and wondrous beauty, which if it can be called wisdom, that would ignite a love for it, and therefore that justifies the explanation that this whole subject belongs in the field of philosophy. Therefore, these are all the problems. Obviously, you can enter into this anytime you'd like. So then. thinking if the if the the soul can separate from the body then another I guess something that will follow from that is that the body uh, is something that the body is is real yeah. and then if the body then I thought well if the body is real then it's it's indestructible the soul and would be indestructible? No, the body, if the body, if the soul can separate from the body, then the body is real. And if the body is real, then it's indestructible. And if it's indestructible, if the body is indestructible, it must be, the body must be something other than this physical form that we normally associate mm -hmm. as being the body, mm -hmm. because these bodies, in our normal states of thinking, mm -hmm. are not uh, indestructible. Mm -hmm. Now, see whether I... We're introducing another word, right? The word now we're introducing is, there must be something about the body other than the physical form of the body. Is that what you're suggesting? Because if, there, if, it's, if the body is, if the body, if the body is real, then then it's uh, immortal. And if it's immortal, then it must be something other than what we think of as the body. As physical. Yes. 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 Yes then you're using the word body other than as a physical thing. That's right, right. that's right. And so I guess that's right. what part of, part of mm -hmm. finding out what the soul is would be actually looking at what the body is as well. And, uh, you remember now you have two things you're talking about. You're talking about the body and the physical shape of things, are you not? Right. You're making a distinction, aren't you? Well, I, I think what I'm trying, I guess I'm, uh, I'm wanting to know in relationship, if I, in relationship to uh, the body, what is the relationship of the soul to the body? And then in determining, in determining that relationship, I have to have a, an accurate description of the body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it, it mm -hmm. may, the body may be something other than our popular notion of body. Yeah. And the popular notion of the body, let's yeah, call physicality. the physicality. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, um, 
what is interesting, see, what you're talking about now is the relationship between the soul and the body. That's what we have now. Right? Right? So here's the soul. Right? And here's the physical body. And we want to know what, after all, is the connection between the two? How does it function in the body? Why is it there? Is there something we can learn about that relationship? Right? There's something we can learn about that relationship. Now, um, the whole development now of philosophy works on a series of analogies. And we like to work up. We like to work up from physical things up. Ancient philosophy always works down. And therefore, we always have a speculative jump, sometimes called metaphysics, when we try to understand these things because our natural desire is to understand things from the everyday world up. But all of the philosophy of the ancients and the Platonic tradition is the other way, down. Let me see if I can uh, um, explain that in this way. We, last time we worked together, we were dealing with the cosmology. Now, in the creation or the whole development of the cosmos, God or the demiurgos, which is the God that, that brings and that works, that brings into existence the ordered universe, you have, therefore, this element, which is God then looks at what is in disorder and he brings it into order. And he tries to bring it into order, or he brings it into order, using himself as the model. But it isn't that he just brings into order a disorder. He goes next, he develops the next step to it, and in that order, he says, look here, we are going to create soul, and this is the idea of soul of the universe. We are going to make the soul of the universe. And he does that, remember, out of being, right? the being that is partless and the being that is partable. He mixes the two, and when he mixes the two, he mixes it in a certain series of ratios, and those ratios show, therefore, there's an intrinsic harmony to the entire development of the soul. Now, all right, why, why are we doing this? We're doing this for one purpose. In bringing into existence the soul of the universe, it only had one purpose, and the purpose was so that uh, the soul then would have as its primary function the care of all the physical world, of the universe. That's its goal. Right? Its primary goal, the soul of the universe, is the care of the universe. And therefore, in order to have care for the universe, since soul then is spread throughout the entire universe, therefore, any time there is anything, or in any occasion, anything happening in any part of it, it knows it instantaneously, and therefore is capable of knowing itself and all of its relative parts in any place. Here's the analogy now. If the, if the soul is to the universe in the same way as the soul is to man, then we can then push out all of the analogies implicit in that. If the soul is to the universe in respect to the fact that everything then in the universe falls into the jurisdiction of its care, so too the soul then 
in ensouling the body, making it animate, bringing life into it, must have as its purpose the care of the body, just as the world soul is said to have the care of all that is body, all body. Now, if it has care for the body, therefore it rules, it's a ruler. This, therefore, is a ruler. Well, if it has the care of the body, then necessarily it must have some intellect. Right? Must have some intellect. If it must care for it, therefore, necessarily, um, it must be, its concern must be directed towards the body. There must be a sympathy for its care. Therefore, there must be some interest towards that uh, activity of caring. The interest is this sympathy, a sympathy for all of its parts. Therefore, when the soul is said to be ensouled in the body, at any point where you touch the body, it immediately signals to the soul that there must be something going on. Since it takes care of the body, then soul is primarily an intellectual, must have some intellectual, primarily an intellectual function. I drove here. Ah, to drive here means I had to have a plan. I drove here because I thought it was important for me to be here. Therefore, I have a care. I'm showing care. I must command myself to do it in order to realize the goal. That's care. The soul is caring for, right, it's caring for me, caring for the body. I drove here because I thought it was important for, for myself to be here. Right? Therefore, I had to have a plan. I must be able to grasp the plan. I must be able to put the plan in operation. Therefore, a soul is primarily an intellectual kind of thing. It's an intellective kind of a thing. Well, if it's an intellective kind of thing, then in its separation, it must not only have the power to separate, because that's a process, and all processes presuppose some kind of power, but it also must have some intellective function. Because suppose someone were to say, it's quite possible to separate the soul from the body, but the soul is, is a kind of dumb. It's not going to retain anything. It's not going to experience anything of any significance because it doesn't have any mind when it separates. Well, then we wouldn't consider it a too significant a journey. Therefore, if there is such a thing as a separation of the soul from the body, right, then there must be some power to it. It must have some intellective sense to it. It must have some unity to it in separating. And if it separates unitarily, it may have some kind of a vehicle. Huh? A form, right, an organization that it must retain. Because then when it comes back, then in coming back, that same intellective power returns to the body and therefore it can still function. And we must ask whether or not that journey had any positive or a negative component to it. Well, look here. If it is possible for the soul to turn about the example that you mentioned a moment ago, if it can turn about and in that turning about know itself, it either knows itself as a part or it knows itself in its entirety. So if it turns about and knows itself in its entirety, that is to say, as a whole, right, at once, not sequentially. Like you dive into a pool of water, you know the water as a whole, at once, immediately. If it's that kind of experience, right, where you can turn about and know yourself, then that means 
if this is any kind of an object and we turn it upon itself so that it touches itself, let's say we can stretch that and touch itself, it will only touch itself at some parts of itself and never as a whole and never at once. No pretzel can touch itself at every place and every, and every part of itself all at once and simultaneously. Therefore, no bodily thing can do that. If no bodily thing can do that, and if it is done, then whatever it is that does that must necessarily be not a physical entity. It cannot be physical. And if it turns about and knows itself, not only is it not physical, but it's not merely sensation. For if it knows itself, it, it's not physical, right? It can, and if it's not physical, that means it's not subject to physicality. Therefore, it's not going to be subject to change. And if it's not going to be subject to change, then in one sense, it's not going to perish. If it can separate itself, then it's not dependent upon the body for its existence. Therefore, it's independent. Therefore, it's independent of the body. Now, if it can know something much more and superior to what it knows when in the body, then we have to judge whether that was significant enough for the journey to take place and how it fits into our picture. So, therefore, let's try it. If there is, therefore, this turning about and knowing itself as a whole, all at once, clearly, soul is not something physical. It's not physical, right? And it, therefore, it must be independent of the body, and it can survive the body, because that's what we mean by it. Now, if it can do that, and if it can, and if it, in that separating, it can recognize itself, see, if it can recognize itself as that which is doing it, then the identity of the self is equally a part of the nature of the soul. If it can separate and it still retains the, the sense that, hey, that's me, it's me, I'm doing it, it's a separation, that's me, right? Therefore, necessarily, the idea of the soul must include one's identity. For if it didn't, if the soul separated from the body, it'd say, hey, goodbye, let me know what it's like when you come back. In that sense, then, the soul's identity would still be retained in the body and not part of the soul, and therefore, the body, therefore, in respect of one's identity, would be built in and a necessary part of the body. If that doesn't happen, but if it takes place in the way I just suggested, therefore, the idea of the soul includes one identity, includes it in the sense that that's what it has or that's what it is. Therefore, we can say in that sense that it's an intellectual function, it's not physical, it maintains one's identity. That means then whatever is experienced, one must know that oneself is doing the experiencing. Hmm. Well, here's the question now. If it does separate, if it does separate, then in what does it participate? Huh? In what does it participate? Because if there's nothing, then it's no journey. If it's a separation of the soul from the body, but there's nothing in which it participates, then there's no journey at all. Therefore, in what does it participate, and what do we mean by this curious word, participation? Well, we sure need something, and it's a good thing we have a piece of chalk to remove some of this. And our first page, right? Here's the idea of participation. Any participating principle right, 
gives to what participates or the participant right, either itself, right, it gives itself, or a part of itself. If it gives part of itself, then we can use the word bestows. Then it bestows life upon animate bodies. And since it can know itself or revert upon itself, therefore, you know what we can say? Let's try it again. See? If anything, any participating principle gives to the participant either itself or some part of itself, and the example we used was, right, if you get into the water, you participate in something, there must be something you participate in, and therefore merge in, become a part of, become a part of, and therefore here's the one principle we need, um, there must either be a resistance on the part of what is being there must be a resistance on the part of what is being participated in or an acceptance of it. That is to say, suppose someone were then to separate the soul from the body and take a very nice trip and came back and said, you know what I encountered? I encountered a sign as soon as my soul left the body and it said, we don't want you. Uh, the price is more than you can pay. Uh, we don't like people who have ten toes on their, their feet, right? or ten fingers. We don't want people separating into this region. Right? Well, either there is a resistance to that participation, or it's an acceptance. The principle in this game is that that participation is entirely open if, if whatever is participating is fit for the reception. Therefore, it's always accessible. It's always accessible if the individual is fit for its reception. No, nothing to overcome. Therefore, there can be emerging, a merging, a become a part of whatever it is. Right? And if that's the case then, all right, uh, what does it find? What then is that thing to which it finds? Now, nearly all of the philosophers who play this game, what I mean by that, get involved in this kind of a discussion, talk about perception. Now, we're talking about what it is that is participated, and we're now it looks like we're changing the subject to participation. But we'll have to bring them together. Look here. Perception is only possible if there's some medium, light. Light is not seen. We do not see light because the only thing we ever see are things that have color. Right? If something has a color, then we can see it. If it has no color, it's invisible. Now, once the object, once an object is placed in the light, then the eye, then the eye can fix on it. The eye then is sometimes talked of as being held by the illuminated object. Right? And then the mind can fasten to it. I see that statue, right? I don't see it fastened. If no object, no perception. Yet all visible objects are more than the color. That is to say, they're more than the light that bounces off it, has some kind of mode of existence. Well then, let's see now if we can do that with the solar. Right. Uh, 
Is it possible we can use the same language? What is it we want to know when the soul separates that it encounters? And what is it it encounters? To what degree then does it participate in it? Participate in it. Suppose it, right? It either loses its boundary, its vehicle, or it is capable of merging with it and still retaining it on its return. And that's one of the most interesting questions there is. If a boundless vision occurs, then why the restricted, why the restricted return to, this, to the everyday world, the everyday sense? Well, what is it that's encountered? See, the eye can't see the light, right? No eye sees the light. It sees through it. Light is not visible. The only people who experience light are these people who separate the soul from the body they experience light. And that's what we have to find out. What is that? How do they talk about it? What shall we say about it? Oh. <clears throat> now, I'm going to use this, these words. What is encountered in experience what is encountered in the experience is a luminous right, radiance. Now I'm going to add to it. Right? That is a light experience. Now look here. What one encounters in that light is not just simply luminosity. What encounters in this is that this is, in fact, life. It's a life that's brilliant and perfect. Therefore, it includes within itself a life principle and an intellectual principle. Why intellectual principle? Because in this seeing, see, in this it's a seeing, it's a knowing. It's a knowing. And therefore, it's a knowing experience, and therefore, it is a knowing or an intellectual, the use of intellect. The eye of the soul is the intellect. Therefore, it brings together life, intellect, and in that, the universal, uh, from everyone in every tradition, that needs nothing, seeks nothing, that is simply just as it is, perfect, being exactly what it is. And it contains within itself, and the key word we need is a goodness. Not the good, but it is good. Not the good, it is a good. Now, what does that mean then? The soul has suddenly taken on light. This, therefore, is the first real experience of light. It's therefore called the source of light. Therefore, in philosophical talk now, we can say, while things are illuminated, we can turn to the source of it and discover the sun. The biggest problem in philosophy is if that parallel, if that can be said to be parallel on the level of the soul, then in the same way, in experiencing this light, there must also be a source to it. Therefore, what can we say? The soul has suddenly taken light. It's recognized as a supreme. It's taken, therefore, 
uh, as uh, immediately recognized as life, intellect, it's brilliant, it's perfect, it's a source of a vitality. And, and here's the big word we need. One recognizes through it all that this is a higher sense of what we mean by real than anything else. Because anything else in comparison with it is a shadow that comes with the experience. Therefore, it's not merely luminosity. That luminosity is real or reality. It's a goodness to it. It's a life principle. It's brilliant, perfect, needs nothing, requires nothing. And yet for this fantastic experience, there is still something that is said to be the very source of it. So therefore, this is seeing the Supreme by the Supreme. Now, we're back to our question. Nice journey, nice vision. But how can this be helpful to man? Was the trip worth it to know this? Well, the, what does the person recognize then? That in the separation, that the nature of reality is good. That it is good. That necessarily it allows any participant, because if the participant, participant in any way is capable of the experience, it is graciously provided. Therefore, it's open and accessible. Right. To those who are ready for it, and therefore, it is a natural avenue, a natural journey into a higher and ultimate reality. But if that's true, why is it so significant? What's so significant about it? Well, you come back and you recognize the nature of reality is good. Apart from all the struggles and strifes and wars and all of the difficulties and pain and suffering going on endlessly, at the core of reality, the nature of reality, it's perfect. That gives us a problem, therefore, we, when we come back, which is, uh, how is it possible that in my everyday experience I perceive things that are less perfect, and yet in the highest vision open to the mind I recognize in reality that it is perfect? To be able to carry this as a question, by the way, is the very heart of Zen Buddhism, or Buddhism. It's a koan. So, now, uh, <clears throat> let me uh, push one I did. Yes, I want to make sure we have that fit for the reception. So, let's go back to one, two, three, four. Why and soul? One. All right. Why? All right. What follows once in the soul? Uh, three. The separation. Four. The turning around, the vision, and the return. According to this reasoning, then that um, in the idea of soul in the classic world, we have a good number of them. So let's take this out. And there is said to be, therefore, the world soul. And <clears throat> there's said to be in the intelligence, the, in, uh, the intelligence, they're said, therefore, to be messengers. And our, that's a Greek word for that is angel. Right? Um, daemons. Not demons, daemons. Heroes. Intelligent beings like you and I. And soul is also occupied with anything that has life, but it need not have intelligent life, right? It can be non-rational life forms. Huh.
You see, in the Greek world, um, heroes are archetypes. Daemons, Socrates was said to have a daemon. A daemon is that uh, inner voice, which if we listen to, right, the inner voice needs to be cultivated. That's a daemon. A messenger or angel is that which can bring, uh, um, obviously, messages from the divine. Uh, world soul is called a god. Because the whole universe is said to, to be in the end of uh, the creation of it, a living god. Now, If throughout this entire thing there is nothing other than goodness unfolding, then with that return journey, return journey then therefore, we have to have been benefited. And what we gain by that benefit is to know that we're living in a universe in which providence reigns. Now providence is a word we don't usually use anymore, very seldom used. Right. It's that which video, right, to see, it's that thing which comes before, prior, right, before seeing, or it is prior, it is a goodness prior to the operation of the intellect. So therefore, after that experience, one then recognizes that the universe, on the basis of reality, is providential. And that means prior to intellect, even before intellectual functioning, there is a beneficent quality to the very heart of reality, which one can ex cannot speculate about alone, but can encounter through this kind of an experience. Now, what's it like to describe, you know, what do people like? How do they describe it? Well, I have a couple of quotes here from Plotinus, and I thought I'd give you one of them. And, uh, All the need is met by a contact purely intellective. At the moment of touch, there is no power whatever to make any affirmation. There is no leisure. Reasoning upon the vision is for afterwards. We, we may know we've had the vision when the soul has suddenly taken light. This light is from the Supreme and is the Supreme. We may believe in the presence when, like that other God, on the call of a certain man, he comes bringing light. The light is the proof of the advent. The light is the proof of the trip, the journey. Thus, the soul unlit remains without that vision. Lit, it possesses what it sought. And this is the true end set before the soul. To take that light, to see the Supreme by the Supreme and not by the light of any other principle. To see the Supreme which is also the means to the vision. For that which illumines the soul is that which it is to see. Just as it is by the sun's own light that we see the sun. Now how is this to be accomplished? Cut away everything. Now, what is this light? All life belongs to it. Life brilliant and perfect. Thus all in, in it is at once a life principle and an intellectual principle. 
nothing in it aloof from either life or intellect. It is therefore self-sufficing. It seeks nothing. And if it seeks nothing, this is because it has in itself what lacking it must seek. It has therefore its good within itself either by being of that order and what we have called its life and intellect or in some other quality or character going to produce these. Oh. Now he's talking about what it is. What is it? See, remember what we asked before? If this is the light, and if there is a natural analogy in the universe between natural forms and this, we are left with this rather interesting and curious puzzle. If the soul then can experience this luminosity, and in the waking world, right, we can then encounter things that we see because of the light, and if there must be a source to the light, the sun, then it must follow, therefore, there must be a source to this supreme experience. And that is called the one. And it's also called the nature of the good itself. Capital, right? The good. Now, the relationship between the good and this kind of vision or pure intellect or pure being, because this is luminosity, this is the luminous experience we talked about. This therefore recognizes, you see, your intellect recognizes the intellect that is uh, the very nature of that experience. So it rec mind recognizes mind. Rec mind recognizes pure mind. Mind recognizes in lum luminous experience the very source of vitality in life. In that overwhelming experience, phenomenologically, that's an experience of what is called in Plato the perfection of beauty. Or beauty itself. But now look what we've called it. We called it mind, we called it vitality, we called it life, we called it supreme. We said phenomenologically, uh, you know, in terms of experience, it's beauty, pure beauty. Let's say it's one, two, three, four, five things we're saying about it, therefore it can't be the one. Therefore the one, if it is the source of that, must hold an even more sacred position than this luminous experience of the divine. Now, that, of course, is going to be another subject of the problem of the one and the many on the highest level. Why well, did we come to that? We said in this magnificent experience, this magnificent experience, it has a unity. A unity of by vitality, luminousness, mind, or intellect, it can be then perceived as or recognized as pure beauty. That's a unity of all of these qualities. That's a many. That's a many. Therefore, even though it is a one kind of experience, it is not the one, if by the one we mean, strictly speaking, absolutely no parts. So, we've taken the trip of the journey of the soul, brought you back to the one many problem, and that's what I wanted to do. So let me throw it open. Um, does, the, uh, does the one live in a castle? Pardon me? Does the one live in a castle? There, no, it doesn't, no, no. No, no castle. Doesn't live in a castle. No castle, no attendance. Well, yes, you can call the light coming out of a castle. If you call that the abode of the divine, right? We can put 
terms to it like that. We call it the abode of the divine. Yeah. What did the Buddhists call it? You call this? What did the Buddhists call it? The, uh, the eighth oxiding picture. Uh, they also call this um, um, Buddha nature. Uh, some very fine descriptions of this are found in uh, many works. Uh, Three Pillars of Zen is a good one for it. Yeah, this is a this is the. Uh, uh, I think most. I think a good number of people would agree. I think it's the eighth ox hurting picture. There's something therefore beyond it. See, the difficulty with this is that this is something you can go in and out of, and therefore you carry it in your memory, so to speak. It becomes part of you, but it's also something therefore that you might cling to, be proud of having, think you're good enough to have had it, build all kinds of images in your mind because of it. And this is why in Buddhism they have that absolutely great concept, the stench of enlightenment. Right? Someone who comes back from this may, <laughs> may have a, a certain aura about them of holiness and they say, oh my gosh, that guy stinks because there's a state beyond that, which is purer than this, which is not an experience that you go in and out of. See, this you go in and out of. In uh, Hinduism, they have an equally beautiful experience called the samadhi that you can go in and out of is no samadhi at all. This is one, rasa, beauty, is another way of describing it. In fact, earlier, earlier on, uh, he based the the intellection of the soul on its uh, caring, caring for the body, and mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I guess the, the, a question that arises for mm -hmm. me is that. Uh, mm -hmm. How can we know that the that the soul actually cares for the body, um, uh, or or that the body, if the if the soul cares for the body, then there must be some some evidence of that of that care, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. we can look at we can look at mm -hmm. the body mm -hmm. prior to the soul's caring. Mm -hmm. And then we can look at the body after the soul's caring, mm -hmm. and there should be some, some, I guess, some difference. Because if we if we cannot find any difference, then we cannot truly say that the that the soul cares. And if we can't say that the soul cares, no. then we can't say that it it has intellection. No. Would you say that all men desire the good as they understand it? Well, I, uh, honestly, I have to. When you say men, I don't. I don't. That's a concept that that's not. It's not familiar. I mean, I, I know there's a popular perception of uh, of men. Okay. Would you say? Uh, does um, would you say? Uh, does mankind? Is that more acceptable? What do you want to call men and women collectively? I don't. I don't know anything to call. Me. I just. I don't well, know what to call men or. Okay, I'll put them together. Or, yeah. Do these things? Do these things? Huh? Do all of these things desire the good? In whatever they desire, do they desire it because they think it may benefit them when they desire it? Here, here's a picture. Here are some people, let us assume, let's take the other case. If we say that these people desire the good, or good things, and these bad things, or harmful things,
Suppose we were to find that this person who desires this bad thing does so because they actually think it's good and they were mistaken, it's really bad. Wouldn't you say this person belongs in this group, really desires what's good? I, yeah, well, actually, I have a problem okay. with assuming the existence of men and women. Okay. And so once I, once I assume mm -hmm. that men and women exist, because mm -hmm. for me, oh, okay. when we say right. that something exists, we say that it is real. Mm -hmm. And if, it, if, if, we, if we assume that men and women exist, and then we base a, a philosophy on that assumption when we have not actually established that, that men and women do in fact exist, I see what you mean. Uh, you mean something very important about exists, don't you? Right. Right. And that is that it, it must. Is real. That it's real. And for, for right for existence to you means it must be real. And if it's real, it must be eternal or immortal. Exactly. Right. Changeless. Right. Immortal. Right. Yeah. Uh, and we haven't established that men and women have immortality. So if they don't have, if men and women don't have immortality, mm -hmm. then they don't really exist. That's so right. Anything that That's we right. Say, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, just to help you in uh, in the language, just for a moment, just a convention. Sure. All right. There's a difference between existence and the word being with a capital B, right? Existence often means is used for things that come in and pass out. Being is, often, is most often described as the way you use the word, real, changeless, immortal. Right? And, and things that have existence are not necessarily real. That's right, that's right. That's right. Using this language. Right. Yeah. So now you're saying, I can answer that question if I can find out that men and women share in this stuff. Right. Not existence. Right. Yeah. Right. Would you say men and women, though, each one of them, could you credit for something that has, would you say these things can uh, set a direction for themselves? Do they set directions? Do they plan? Do they plan on eating? Do they plan on walking across the street? Beings? Uh, these things, men and women. Men and women, just for the moment. Do these things plan? I can't, I mean, I can't, until we establish that they, that they have being. Well, yeah, maybe we can do that if we first just ask the existence question. Do these things that come into existence and pass out of existence, men and women, right, when they exist coming in, right, do they in their lives set plans? I would say that things that exist, things that have things that exist mm -hmm. set plans yeah, and yeah, yeah. directions. Right, right. And then they set directions for themselves, and they also command themselves to go ahead and do those things. Right. right? whether they're successful or not is something else. Do they do that because they seek uh, to uh, gain something they think is significant for themselves? Oh, right. In that sense, if they seek to gain what they hope or believe may be a good, right, then these things taken together say there must be something inside of them Right? In so far as they have existence, that cares. They may be mistaken about what they choose to be their good, but they're all seeking good. Now, the thing in a person that sets plans and directions and commands, go get it, because it seeks to gain from that a good, that thing that does that in us is called soul. That's the 
definition for solar. Right, that we okay. talked, that, yeah, that right, was, right. talked about that last week. Right. So now, if the soul can do all of these things we described tonight, then the soul is immortal. And therefore, these things have not only existence, but being. And therefore, not that they say, well, let me make one more step and we can perhaps help it. There's a part which is immortal. We're calling that being. There's a part that is very mortal, right? <laughs> and um, that's, th see, all of that is activity, isn't it? That's involved, it's all activity. So their mortal part is in activity. And would you agree, not only is it in activity, necessarily it's seeking a goal, it's seeking Right, makes plans, directions, right, commands itself. It's in time. It functions in time. But that part of the soul that we talked about that separates from the soul from the body in that experience we described, that's real, immortal, and It knows simultaneously the whole. Watch now. Anything that you can know simultaneously as a whole, all at once, is, a, is the word for eternity or eternal. Therefore, there's a part of the soul. See, part of the soul, therefore, is two parts. One is immortal. Therefore, it must have some kind of thing called being. It, it, it must be real, eternal, right? and immortal. And the way in which you can talk about that word being is this curious word, usia in Greek, right? Which is that thing which is capable in us to turn around and know itself. That takes on the word in English, essence. Sometimes they translate it as being. So therefore there's a part of the soul which has an essence, that part which can turn around and know itself. There's a part which is mortal in its activity, therefore the soul has an essence and an activity. Essence is in eternity or eternal, and its activity is in time. Wow, well, well, look here. We can then do this. We can say, isn't that curious? Because uh, being itself, that luminous reality, that luminous radiance, right, of what is ultimately real, right, that exists, the essence of that, right, the essence of that is eternal. And since it is it is a dynamic, its activity, right? Its being is eternal and its activity is eternal, both. <laughs> so therefore, its essence is eternal and its activity is eternal. Therefore, soul, its essence is eternal, its activity is in time, now, you know what? There are other kinds of things, like this chalk, right? Uh, all of its parts are subject to change. Nothing survives. Therefore, its essence is in time. And its activity, or what you do with it, is in time. So you see, that's a, that's a mean proportion. Both are in time. Both are eternal. The soul, therefore, has one part. And like these other things, one part that's in time. Therefore, it's a mean proportional. Yeah, I guess what I, what, what I, as you were doing that, I was thinking that the only part, the only part of man that is real mm -hmm. is that part which is, it has the same characteristics as the one. And, and or, or being, right? Or being. Yeah, right, right. Then uh, that's why I question mm -hmm. the existence of 
of men oh, yeah. because the only right. the that's only right. part that's of right. men that that's real is the uh, is the one. So yeah. if I say yeah. mm -hmm. that if I if I give if mm -hmm. I posit the existence of men, mm -hmm. all I'm, I'm actually I'm actually positing is the existence of mm -hmm. the one, yeah. and that men are is a, is a, that men and women. They are only myth. The, the man and woman is just a myth that, yeah. Uh, yeah. that that's being passed along or yeah. that is coming to existence. Yeah, that's right. You're saying, are you not? And, uh, that there is something common to us all, right? And that's what's real. Well, and to the degree that we can participate in that real, but even when you say, or one, when we say yeah. us, then we are assuming. We're assuming that the the thing that per, that makes a multiplicity mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. real, and and it seems as though the mm -hmm. multiplicity mm -hmm. is not is not real either. So That's the right. concept of us is, must drop. Is dropped. That's right. Totally agree. That's right. See, what you just moved from is is the idea of individual souls to the idea of soul, to the idea of what is real as reality. Right? And then you saw immediately that that has to, you have to now consider something higher than that since that's a unity, right? And therefore there must be a one above it all and that is what really is. That's right, that's right, that's right. right. You've gone through these categories. Now, uh, if we had more time, the question, the fun, thing to explore and to put into words and see whether you can make sense of it is how there can be individual souls. Can you talk about a collective? How does that relate to world soul? Are they parts of it? Do they share in it? Do they participate in it? Right. That's a one-many problem. Then on the level of reality, if each of these souls is capable of experience the nature of this reality, then, good heavens, if that's true, then uh, if they experience the same thing and recognize in that experience it discloses something about themselves, that is, they know themselves, then they know the same thing <laughs> about them all. Yeah, that's right. I know it's, the time is late, but what I'd like to be able to do is, uh, is to establish the existence of individual souls. I don't, no. have, I don't have the tools to, to, um, to okay. lead myself through that, How? that uh, proof. Yes. And we should take some time out and do it. But see, the part that you're talking about is very important because that's the return. See, after that vision, why aren't we totally different? Why aren't we totally changed? Why don't we tell people that that was me yesterday, I'm no longer me yesterday, I'm totally different. We can, there's still something about us that we still recognize that has some kind of continuous identity. That's the problem of individual soul. And I hope, that's the one many problem. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay? All right, thank you very much.